Good morning. Today is the fourth in the Project Hope series, and I'm calling this one Resilience. Um, it's interesting that I'm do I'm taping this the day before Ramadan starts. I'm going to basically take a month off during Ramadan to focus on my more spiritual development, my fasting, all of that stuff. But I thought I would start with resilience today. Now, resilience is a fancy word for being able to bounce back. Now, when something is resilient, if you touch it, it bounces back. And what we need to do is cultivate resilience, not only in ourselves, but in our children. And how do we do that? Uh, I think the main thing is that we need to we need to level with our kids. A lot of the time, adults, now that I'm speaking to adults right now, adults don't talk to children. They talk at them. They don't actually explain things because sometimes it takes a lot of time to explain why they should take a certain course of action that's good for them. So instead of explaining why that taking that course of action is necessary, we shelter kids from what they what they might not know. And now sometimes we need to shelter them because it can be overwhelming. But at other times, they need to start developing an awareness of what they're up against. Now, they're, they, I don't know of anybody who doesn't have their share of struggles during their life. And children are no different. We might want them to have an idealistic childhood, but each child is going to have their own challenges. And the thing is, developing resilience means letting them face those challenges and learning how to uh, to fail learning how to succeed and learning that moment when you feel proud that you were able to go through something difficult and how are they going to get that how are they going to develop that resilience unless they go through things that are difficult i mean we've heard of snowplow parents where parents try to prepare the road, they take out all the obstacles, and they think that that's going to help their children. Now, they might have good intentions, but that doesn't help the child. What the child sees is your own anxiety. They see the parent's anxiety. Oh, um, we got to get rid of these obstacles. We want to make the, the, the road smooth. And what does that really tell the child? That tells the child, when the child sees their parents anxious like that, it develops their own anxiety within them, and also it the, the underlying uh, the underlying message that gives to the child is that you can't handle it. Okay, I'm trying to protect you because you can't handle it. Now that's not the intention of the parent. The parent is just trying to make things easier for their child. I mean, why wouldn't we? But at the same time, <laughs> that's not the message that they're getting. With uh, with my own children, I have four children, and I have uh, a, almost a dozen grandkids. Okay, now and in terms of my own children, some people might think that I was being cruel, but actually, what I learned to do was always speak the truth. Okay, well, in in my religion, there's a saying of the prophet. He said, "Speak the truth, even if it is bitter and displeasing to people." And my kids knew from an early age. Hey, if you ask me my opinion, I'm going to give you the truth. So when they would bring a project that they had done, or when they would bring me some artwork, in, and they asked me, well, what do you think? Uh, I would look at them, and if I didn't like it, or if I thought it needed, I mean, I wasn't intentionally cruel, but if, if I thought that it could have been done better this way or that way, I would say so. And then they would get a little bit upset, and I'd say, no, look, if you wanted my opinion, I have to tell you the truth. But then, when they did something outstanding, like my daughter, one of my daughters, she's very artistic, and she did this one painting that blew me away. I mean, she called it the orphan child. And when I saw it, I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. And I, and I gushed, and I said, oh, this is amazing. And then she said, are you just saying that? I said, look, when I was telling you the critique, you didn't assume that I was just saying that. So now that I'm actually saying I like something, you should be able to accept it as the truth. I'm not going to lie to you. Now, in doing presentations with, with, with students in classrooms, I do a lot 
of school presentations because I'm a storyteller as well as an author. And what I found was that a lot of the time these days children are very coddled. Okay, and, and that coddling, like I said, that snow plow attitude where you're trying to remove the obstacles in the road is leading to more anxiety, not less. Okay, it's not preparing our children at all. It's not developing resilience in them. So then when, in, in fact, all the praise that a lot of the children are getting, and even then, the intentions to praise children was to develop their self-esteem. What it's actually done is the opposite. Because children are so used to being praised that they don't want to put themselves in a situation that's risky where they don't get praised, where they actually fail. And as a result of that, they're afraid to try. I mean, if you look at some of the Disney movies like Zootopia and stuff, one of the themes in there was to try and fail, okay? Because you're not always going to get success on the first time. In fact, mostly you're not going to get success the first time you do things. I mean, if I got success the first time I, got, I wrote a story, <laughs> I would have been <laughs> published a long time ago. It took me eight years to get my first book published. But that's because... Uh, I really stuck to it and I didn't give up. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of kids these days are giving up too easily. Now, when I was talking to kids, I've seen that lack of resilience, that fear of failure in kids. And what we have to do is we have to show kids that it's okay to fail. In fact, by failure, you're going to learn things that you didn't learn before. And in fact, one of the things I emphasize in my workshops is that Rejection is actually part of the process. If I didn't get rejected when I was starting to write, I would never have improved. I never would have improved. Because re the, the, the mind is a lazy thing, okay? Your imagination is kind of lazy. The first ideas and stories it comes up with is something it remembers. I mean, nobody wants to work harder than it had. They have to, right? So your mind is the same way. And the first stories you come up with are not going to be very original. And you are going to go through moments where you're going to struggle, okay? Where you're going to think, okay, well, I already did that idea. Do I want to do it again? No. Don't do it again. Instead, demand more for your imagination okay that's part of developing resilience and in the process you're going to fail you're going to try things and they're not going to work and in all the movies that we see we never we see the people succeed and we see like a montage uh, with a, some catchy music and stuff while they're trying and failing okay but we never actually see that process because it's kind of boring it's hard it's not easy it's frustrating and we want to get to the the success okay but as a result sometimes children have a skewed uh, uh, idea of what it takes to succeed. Now, the other thing I realized on my own as I was growing up, and I think this is one of the things that developed resilience in myself, I realized that, you know what, the marks that I, would, I was getting in uh, grade school, even grade 7, 8, all the way up to about grade 10, those marks... <laughs> are actually not that important. Why are kids stressing over getting A's when those marks are not the marks that are going to count? Instead, what I did, and even with my children, this is what I did, I focused on learning. Because I figured, I realized myself, I thought, you know what, I don't have to worry about the mark. Because if I just learn this stuff, when I do the test, the marks will follow. I mean, and so what I did instead was I actually focused on learning what the teachers were telling me. Now, I failed a lot. And the funny thing, I think the funniest thing is that um, one of the things I always wished I could have got was the prize for oral oral communication. Like we had those oral speech arts and all that kind of stuff. Not once. I mean, I got to the to the stage like where I was going in front of the school, but not once did I ever win. I never won those things. Never. In all my history of my, my school, I never won those things. Isn't it ironic that I grew up to be a storyteller? And I can speak to audiences of 600. I think my biggest audience was about 1,300. When I was accepting the Golden Kite Award for Big Red Lollipop in L.A., 1,300 people. I have no problem talking in front. Of, in fact, I love it. Okay, I have, um, I've got the inner ham in me. But I love public speaking and I love storytelling. And I became a storyteller even though I never once 
won those speech arts things. Okay, the people who win those things don't necessarily go on to be successful in that. It's the way things go. Never won any awards for my writing when I was growing up. Now that I'm an adult and I'm writing, I have won awards. And all those kids are being pressured to make it as a career when you're just a child. Oh, that's that's ridiculous. When you're a child, you should focus on being a child. You should focus on learning and becoming who you are and developing your own personality. Okay. Now, so in terms of resilience, one of the things that I tell, I talk to kids about was that I had a very hard childhood. I mean, I really, <laughs> I suffered. Okay. And my father was quite, would be considered quite abusive. I mean, he was a typical Pakistani father and he used to hit us a lot. I always thought my father was a very difficult, hard father. Um, the, but the thing is, and this is what I talk to kids about, I didn't realize that what he was doing I mean, his methods were unnecessary. He didn't have to be that harsh. But what he was actually doing was actually for my benefit. For example, he taught me how to read even before I started school. So that once I started school, I had the skills I needed to become a good reader. And that reading would go on to uh, affect the rest of my life. Now, one of the things that happened... And this was actually the inspiration for this book of mine. So I'll mention this a little bit. This is my second novel. It's called Wanting More. And it was up for about 14 different awards around the world. And it's been published all over the world in China, Japan, Italy, uh, India, uh, Australia, New Zealand, a lot of different places, Charger. So different languages. Now, what happened was my older sister, who's actually the star of Big Red Lollipop, um, in 2003, she died of breast cancer. Now, a year before she was diagnosed, her husband of 19 years had run off with another woman. I always thought my brother-in-law was such a nice father. I never saw him hitting his kids. My, ne my nephew and niece, the way my father used to hit us. So I always assumed he was a really nice father. But look what he did to his family. And this, I talked to kids about this. Because I want them to realize and look at their own situation in a different way. Because the way we look at things, our attitude towards our, our, our growing up is really crucial. Okay, so what I always thought my brother-in-law was such a nice father. He never hit his kids like my father hit us. But look what he did to his family. He destroyed his family. And then when my sister died, my kids, my, my nephew and my niece, they were stuck in a very difficult situation. And then I started to think about my own father. Like, we, I, we grew up very poor. At one point, my father lost his job. We could have gone on welfare, but he refused. He said, no, I'm not going to take charity. I mean, there's nothing wrong with welfare. But he, he thought, I'm not going to do that. Instead, he went out and he got another job. Only It was only for $2.35 an hour. Even back then, this was like the 70s. Even back then, $2.35 an hour was not enough to feed a family of six people. At the end of the month, when my parents paid their bills, uh, there was only $5 a week left over with which to buy food for six people. $5 to feed six people. Most of the time we grew up eating a lot of dill weed and potato because it was cheap and fulfilling. So I grew up very poor, very poor. Um, but And the thing is that my father would often work 16 hours a day. 60 from 8 o'clock in the morning to 12 o'clock at night. He'd come home eat, sleep, pray, and get up and do it again. And he did this for years. And as a result, all that pressure, that financial pressure, it does something to a man. A lot of the time, men get their, their self-esteem because their ability to provide for their families. I mean, that's a big thing. And um, my father was struggling to provide for us. And he just that pressure. And at his workplace, they were calling him swear words. The racism was that bad here in Canada, the racism was that bad that they used to call him swear words at, at his workplace and he put up with it because he had a wife and four children to feed. Now, because of that, he had a terrible temper, all of that pressure on him. And yes, he came home and he used to hit us a lot. He used to abuse us. And the thing is, so like I thought he was a really hard father. But now when I saw my brother-in-law abandon his father, I mean his family, it occurred to me that my father could have done that too. It's it's an option, okay? He could have left. And 
you know, my mom did not have a good education. There were four kids under 10 years old. We would have been up, up a creek. $2.35 an hour, that would have been enough for him. He would have been fine. We would have been up a creek. We would have been, we would have struggled like anything. And I thought, you know, if anybody would have run away, it was my father. And I thought, why didn't he? And I couldn't understand it. And then my father said something that actually became the theme of wanting more. And this is what I tell kids too. And I think it's going to build resilience, I hope. Well, I asked my father. I couldn't understand it. When I was writing Wanting More, I had to understand the father. And I, I couldn't understand it. So I went up to him one time and I asked him, I said, Daddy, how come you never ran away? I said, look, my brother-in-law, he ran away. He broke his family like that. He abandoned them. How come you never ran away? It was really hard. And my father said something very interesting. What he said was that he said, you know, uh, when, when, you, when you have a clay pot and you want to make it strong, you put it in the fire. And if you take that clay pot, pot out of the fire too quickly, it's going to crack and it'll be useless. He said, you know, we're made out of clay because we believe that God made Adam, the first man, out of clay, and we are the children of Adam, so we're also made out of clay. And he said that when, when I was going through that difficulty, I thought, this is God putting me in the fire. If I try to come out of this fire too quickly, I'm going to crack and I'll be useless. And he thought, I have to be patient. I have to wait until God takes me out, and then I will be strong, then I will be useful. That's why I never left. And when he said that, I thought, wow. You know, I had always seen my father um, as a bent, hard worker with a very bad temper. I had never seen the potential in him, what he could have done if he had had the kind of opportunities that he worked so hard to give me and my siblings. I mean, we were able to thrive and do better than him. But he worked, carried our family on his back. And all of that pressure left him bitter and left him resentful and left him angry. That's why he had such a, a razor temper. Now, that became the theme of wanting more. This story is really about a girl who's going through her firing. And what I tell kids, and she's trying to come out of the firing with her principles intact, without cracking and without being useless. Now, what I tell kids is this. I said, you know what? You're all going to go through your own firing. It's guaranteed. Everybody has their challenges. And it's important that when you're going through your challenges, hold on to what you know is right and stay away from what you know is wrong. If you can do that, then you can emerge through your firing without cracking and without being useless. It means an adjustment of what you value. It, and, and we are heading into a very difficult time. With the pandemic, I mean, it's, it's going to be tough. The next few years are going to be even more tough than they have been for some people. And there are people who are going to go through incredible difficulties. And that's why I wanted to do this presentation today. Because, you know, we need a reminder that what to really value. Okay, uh, we need to get away from the materialism and value strength of character. Work hard. If you have food in your fridge and you have a roof over your head, it might not be as nice as other people's and the things that we are sold as a society through television and media. We're sold a certain standard of living. I didn't grow up with that standard of living. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. But what we need to do is value what's important, value our family, help each other. And when we do that, when we rise above our situation, we develop our esteem in a way that is organic and that cannot be broken. We can emerge through this stronger, intact, without cracking and without breaking our who we are and what we are. Okay, so that's my, my, um, my, my ideas about resilience, developing resilience. I went through a lot. I had the abuse at home. I had the racism at school. Uh, there were times when I wanted to quit. But I'm telling you to keep going. Find your truth. Find your path forward. 
there is always a path forward and stay resilient, bounce back and know that your value does not depend on what you own. It, it depends on who you are and we can get through this. Don't forget to subscribe and we're all in this together.